Welcome to Share Talk, the only podcast where investors come first. Hello and welcome to Share Talk. Today I'm joined by Mike Ingram, who's an independent market strategist. How are you today, Mike? Uh, morning, Zach. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Uh, on the financial market front, we are looking at a time when we've got SPAC mania going on at the moment. Uh, but perhaps you could run us through that. Well, I think actually this is all part of a, a broader picture of what the market thinks is going to happen next. So if you go back to March of last year, so when the sort of first COVID panic first hit, then, you know, just everything was just sold off indiscriminately. And then very, very shortly, we went on this episode where anything which had a growth label, anything that was seen as a beneficiary of the COVID pandemic, just went ballistic. And on the flip side of that, anything which was traditionally classed as a value stock, anything which was, you know, very exposed to the economic cycle was very badly hit. Now, on the face of that that's all fairly sensible you just go well hang on market conditions have changed so the you know, share that that's going to impact share price performance but the issue was to the degree to which that happened and you know you ended up with a situation where some stocks were just you know priced for perfection or even beyond that if that makes any sense at all and other stocks which are completely toxic and this essentially un- uninvestable now that started i think to change in arguably November last year, you start to have some of these vaccines um, came onto the horizon and you started to get some of these stocks which had done very, very well in the immediate preceding months, starting to falter a little bit, but generally making a bit of headway. But you started to see a bit of interest in some of the more cyclical names. It was when you started to see a bit of interest, for instance, in the FTSE 100, because, you know, that, that's famously, you know, very exposed to things like miners and energy and so forth. Anyway, we, as we go into 2021, you start to get, as, this, as you say, this SPAC mania, this special purpose acquisition company, who are basically essentially shell companies filled with cash. You say, well, we're going to buy something and it's going to be great. Now, that for me, to some extent, indicates a sort of top of the market kind of environment because we've seen these kind of vehicles in the past. It goes back to the 18th century, the South Sea bubble for investors to have an undertaking into uh, you know something of great value, but we won't tell you what it is. You've had them in the 1920s. They were called blind pools and SPACs featured quite heavily in dot-com, financial crisis, etc. So th- there is a sort of a, you know, a bit of an albatross kind of aspect to SPAC mania. Now, to some extent also, this was a bit of a holdover from the previous phase, which I just described to the stock market, which was just valuations just racing ahead. And because some of these SPACs take a bit of time to set up, a lot of them might be viewed as being quite opportunistic. It's like, well, the market's frothy. Um, you know, let's get a SPAC rolled out. Let's get the cash in. And then uh, maybe let's try and figure out what to do with the cash. So to sort of quote Warren Buffett, there's this sort of situation where they say, well, when the tide goes out, you find out that you know, he's swimming, swimming naked. You had this massive surge in SPACs, particularly February, March this year. But as we've got into April, we're now in a situation where the market's showing some fatigue with these things. Um, now, don't get me wrong. I've created a very gr- grim picture of SPACs so far. Not all SPACs are... are created equal some of some of them have a you know a definite plan the people who are behind the SPAC have got a good track record in spotting new opportunities and all effectively they're doing is they're just disintermediating the sort of investment banks who normally get very heavily involved in this sort of thing but there's also no doubt that a lot of these things are that it's, <laughs> there are chances behind them shall we say and um it's nothing but an artifact of a very frothy market as i said they're now looking a bit wobbly um there's signs of severe market indigestion on this and it makes me wonder actually you know what the next phase of the overall market is going to be as we approach a phased unlocking of economies as perhaps growth prospects start to pick up where's the investor focus going to be if it's no longer this sort of laser focus on growth and as i say these spacs are starting to stumble a little bit you say stumble, but uh, presumably there are a few factors involved here. One is that uh, a SPAC is really a reaction to how long it takes to set up a stock market listing. I think the quickest you can do one these days is probably about two months. So uh, as we're in a fast moving market, whether it's NFTs one week or crypto the next week or whatever we're looking at, we've got the FTSE 100 still below where it was in 1999. So you could say at least on this side of the Atlantic, things are not frothy at all. Uh, mm. So that's something to remember. And I suppose also here on this side of the pond, 
The SPACs are sort of normally like a few million, not 300 a million or 200 million dollars, which we've seen in the US. So isn't it, is it something which is just a health warning and there's no way that these can succeed? Or do you think this could be, it could be different this time? Well, it's a bit, well, I'll never say it's different this time. I mean, look, it's a mi- as I indicated, it's a mixed bag. And you, you say that, you know, some of these things have gone into trouble. It's a function of a fast-moving market. I, I wouldn't entirely agree because it depends what you mean by fast-moving market. Usually when people say fast-moving market, that implies a certain amount of volatility. And generally speaking, we haven't seen that much volatility. We have seen very occasional episodes. We saw this most recently, I guess, in the Archegos. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. Liquidation, you know, you saw some big moves on various stocks you could pronounce it long-term capital management i think as well, well if you it, wanted to you know you can bring it down to the arch egos <laughs> i think you know i mean there's not is there not an alarm bell there somewhere but anyway it's very difficult to actually describe the market that we've been in at the moment as being volatile i mean vix at what 17 something like that it's, it's you know it's been lower but it's been an awful lot higher as well um, I, I think it's indicative of a greedy market. And as you say, you know, there is a bit of a lead time for issuing a SPAC and even more for an IPO. And then, you know, I have to tell you, we've seen one or two IPOs which have been found high and dry because they were just mad. They were chasing pricing, which was probably being supported at the end of last year rather than being supported in March and April 2021. Is it different this time well it's different in the sense that some of the supporting factors are going to be there for a while so there's no doubt for instance that one of the attractions of SPACs is that the opportunity cost of holding cash is very very low because you're not really getting much if anything on a deposit so you say well hang on I'll invest in a SPAC at 10 and if they come up with something great I can ride it on the way up and if I don't like the look of it I can always vote as a shareholder and you know liquidate my position at 10. So it's it's, it's almost like a call option kind of structure Um, and that can only really exist as I say in a very very low interest rate environment and then allied to that obviously you've got banks buying up effectively their own debt I mean you've got 90 plus percent of the bills issued at the Bank of England to be bought by the Bank of England Other investments are being squeezed out. Investors are being squeezed into, you know, riskier assets. And that's a deliberate policy by the Bank of England. They wouldn't necessarily frame quite like that. But that's what they're they're trying to do. And then, of course, you've got now, most recently in the last 12 months, a lot of the public money going into support businesses and so on and so forth. So a lot of investors are going to think, well, you know, my downside is relatively protected. I get n- virtually nothing by letting that cash sit in the bank. I may as well have a punt. <laughs> so, and sometimes it works out. And sometimes it doesn't. I mean, I think the problem is, is that, as I say, there has been this bad mania. I think you've got something like 440, 450 listed SPACs in the US at the moment. And half of them basically haven't done anything yet. Uh, I've I read that of the, of the specs in the last two years, there's only one in four has actually made an investment. And generally speaking, after two years, you've got to hand the ca- cash back. So to some to some extent, it's a bit overblown, the whole mania thing. But the other thing is you've got about another 500 specs waiting to lift. And so you're not surprised that people who are investing in these things, particularly the institutional investors who normally step in after the SPAC is listed with so-called pipe financing, you know, there's the private investment in public equity. They're just looking at these and just going, do you know what? We, we can afford to be a bit pickier at this stage. There's a lot of it around. We think maybe the market's turning for a lot of these would-be acquisition vehicles. Um, we can demand better terms. But the flip side of that, of course, is they're demanding better terms. Then that might be dilution for shareholders already in the SPAC. All right. So finally, what's your view? By the end of the year, it'll be all over? Well, I think we'll likely see a, a change in gear. So, you know, I, I said we've had this shifting gear from growth and momentum, probably more to something a bit more value-oriented. I, I think that by the time we go, my guess would be late summer, early autumn, maybe September, October, we'll have another change in gear, and that might well be to so-called quality stock stocks, which with, with solid balance sheets, fat margins, you know, good cash flow, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason I say this is because, take the UK, for instance, you're seeing a lot of the government support is going to be tapered into September. You know, furlough is going to roll, roll off, for instance, in September, at least on current plans. But there was a bit of research out for the Bank of International Settlements a week or so ago that pointed to this so-called bankruptcy gap, you know, relative to the shock that the economy, or what economies have suffered there's a relative lack of bankruptcies and of course that gap at the moment is explained by the amount of largely the amount of government support i mean central banks only have been at zero since forever pretty much now so that hasn't really changed substantially but you're now seeing banks 
try to claw back so-called bounce back loans in the UK. And you will, say, as I say, see this tapering support. So I'm just wondering at that point, a lot of businesses which actually aren't viable at the moment get exposed. And at that point, you know, you might have the market start to differentiate on issues such as balance sheet, liquidity, etc. So you've had the flight to trash. And maybe now, before the end of the year, I think you're probably going to see a flight to quality. And what about the scenario, sort of extra question, actually, what mm-hmm. about the scenario where, whereby it's a Mexican standoff, or at least the government has a gun to its head in, from from businesses and even from individuals who just say, look, it's the end of September, but if you get rid of uh, furlough, we're finished and just, we, you know, the whole thing's gonna, system's going to collapse. And so basically furlough never really ends. It becomes a selective furlough. It doesn't really finish. What about that it, scenario? Yeah, well, I think there's some that suggested that, you know, it's furlough effectively become a permanent feature of the economic cycle. It's possible, but, you know, you only have to look to the last budget in the UK to you know, show that the Chancellor isn't totally adverse to having a pop at business yeah. when it wants to in order to, you know, shall we say, balance the books or help balance the books. And he, you know, for instance, he would say, well, you know, I'm, I'm giving you every opportunity to, to invest as front-loaded tax breaks, etc. As a government, no government is out to underwrite every single investment, every single business risk, basically underwrite the, the entire entrepreneurial, and I, would, I guess that's in air quotes, sector. Because it is private enterprise, and you know, if you're not prepared to do that, then you shouldn't be. You shouldn't be in business, quite frankly. And again, the broader picture, and this is shades of the, of the great financial crisis. It's like, well, hang on, and we're, we're again we're in a situation where you're saying, well, hang on, we're going to privatise gains, and we're going to underwrite and socialise losses, and we can't keep doing that because apart from the financial impact on that, which is relatively minimal, though, because everybody else is at it, you're not seeing the sort of fallout you would normally see on sterling, for instance, because, you know, US is also engaged, for instance, in this kind of lunatic economics. It's very caustic from a, from a socio-political perspective, and we know that one of the after-effects of this whole COVID-19 episode is going to be increasing wealth and income inequality and and making furlough ironically that is actually going to make that worse it's not going to make that better you know if business is in business to do business then get on and do it you know i think the government frankly has done (laughs) an impressive you'd said 18 months ago that uh, that certainly a tory government will be providing the sort of support in even in a, a hypothetical crisis you would have said that well you know what are you smoking uh, and yet it's happened. I would not be in favour of that. And in fact, I think the broader picture, as I've said on you know, previous podcasts, is that public sector, and that includes the Bank of England, needs to get the hell out of markets because it's uh, it's throwing up some very unpleasant side effects. And ultimately, that is not good for anybody. It's not even good for investors, ultimately. Well, on that note, we are enjoying being in the United Kingdom of the USSR and the sort of socialist <laughs> Marxist uh, economy that we have. Uh, Mike Ingram, independent market strategist. Thank you very much indeed. My pleasure, sir. Thank you for listening. Remember to visit our website for more news and other podcasts at www.share-talk.com.